Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. The great cost to correction. You don't have to turn here, but I want to read some verses, and then if you want to, turn to Titus chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter, and the key verse that we're looking for is, is second, or Titus chapter 2, verse 15. But 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All good works. So this scripture here helps us to find good doctrine, true doctrine. Some brethren are straying from the Bible and come up with their own doctrines. But true doctrine for reproof. Now as we're going to learn that when, we, when you have to reprove somebody, that's because they refuse correction. For correction. Okay? For instruction in righteousness. This tells you how to live so you can judge yourself and God can judge your life and say, okay, this needs to go, that needs to go. Uh, you're not doing this when you're supposed to be doing this. Pray without ceasing. Study, like we just read here, study, show that proof of abstain from all appearance of evil. Be not drunken. You're not to fornicate. You're supposed to have a sound speech, which we're going to be reading here shortly. Your, your speech is supposed to be clean. On and on and on and on. Okay. But we see that it's for correction, and there comes a time where you have to correct brethren, and you have to reprove brethren. What's the ultimate cost of having to correct and reprove a brother or sister in Christ? Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. What happens when you, f f uh, what happens when you ignore the correction and the reproof? That's when the chastening of the Lord comes. But it also says here, neither be weary of his correction. God's always going to be correcting you through the brethren. Sometimes he'll correct you through his word with your daily readings and daily studies. Through, and, then, and like I said, through a brother or sister in Christ. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Proverbs 15.10 we read, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. There's some brethren that have forsaken the way and they don't want to be corrected. It's grievous to them. But it's necessary. Okay? And he that hateth reproof shall die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. But the wages of sin is still death. It said, the Bible says if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. If you refuse correction and you refuse reproof, being reproved, okay, um, then sin, if you keep living in sin, sin, sin eventually will kill you. The chastening of the Lord will come, and then the Lord's the one that will say, okay, enough is enough. I said the sin will kill you, but if you live by the flesh, you shall die. Why? Because God will chasten you to get you back on the right path. You reject that chastening and ignore it. Oh, it's not the chastening of the Lord. It's just happen chance. Or it's the enemy. Or we're under spiritual attacks. It's not the chastening of the Lord. And you just keep ignoring it. Eventually he will kill you and bring you home early. 1 Timothy 5.20 says, Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Now some people mistaken that word. They see how it says rebuke. Them that sin rebuke before all. In other words, you've already tried correcting him one on one. You tried going to him and correcting him as a brother in Christ. They refuse that correction, then you rebuke them before all. But it says, them that sin, rebuke. That's what rebuke is. You're rebu they've, they've ignored correction, you need to rebuke them before all. There are, as we're going to get in this study, some situations where you skip correction and you go straight to rebuke because it's that serious and it's that bad. It's that bad. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Exhort. It's a good thing to tell brethren that they need to obey the Word of God. When you catch them doing something wrong and you tell them, hey, what you're doing there is wrong and you need to repent, and they do, you exhort them. That's a good thing, brother and sister Christ. If you catch somebody that's still doing the right thing, okay, you exhort them. And say, you're, you're following the scriptures, praise the Lord. Give God the glory, and you exhort Him. Exhorting is basically motivating Christians to keep their eyes on Jesus by keeping His word and living a life of Christ. That's exhorting the brethren. 
Right? You correct them, to, and you can exhort them after correction when they repent. Right? But they refuse correction, then it goes to reproving and rebuking. Uh, Titus chapter 2, we're going to read the whole chapter real quick and explain that you have the Christians that they're supposed to be following this. Okay, it says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. We've got some brethren that are, are slipping away from sound doctrine. They're turning their backs on truth. One of the things we'll be talking about in a future study is the, another part of the armor of God. We talked about the belt, but we haven't got to any of the other pieces. It's not the belt, I'm sorry. We got to talk about how people claim it's a belt, but it's not a belt. It's, it's an action. You're supposed to gird up your loins with truth. It's an action. We already talked about that part. Um, next thing we're going to talk about is the helmet for a hope of salvation. What's one of the doctrines that brethren have started to turn their back on is the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see part of it here. How do you look for the coming of Jesus Christ to happen any day? How do you look for that coming? Well, this is how. Speak thou to the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith, and charity and patience. You're looking for Jesus Christ to come back every day, so you're focusing on these things saying, I'm going to live for the Lord every day. He could come back any day now. I'm going to live for him any day, every day. Okay. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Teachers of good things. This is a whole other study, but a lot of the women out there, um, they struggle. I've had every sister that I've ever known that I believe is a Bible-believing, God-fearing sister in Christ, every one of them has admitted that they struggle with feminism. Because this wicked world really pushes that on the children. They push it on people, jobs, government. It's feminism is everywhere. They struggle with that. And one thing that very disappointing among the body of Christ is I've yet to see an elder woman in the body of Christ stand up and go, okay, I'm going to teach good, the young women good things, and here's the list of those good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. I don't see the elder woman teaching the younger women to be sober. Most women that I see, I'm pointing over here at my computer, that get on YouTube, they try to um, become pastors, preachers, and teachers. Okay? There's no such thing, these Bible buildings, women's Bible study where a woman gets to stand up there and preach anything in the Bible, but there's only women present, so that makes it okay. No, it's still wrong. This is the boundary in which they're allowed to preach. They preach anything else, they're in sin. They're trying to be pastors. They're trying to be men. Okay? That they may teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste. That's a hard one for some of the I mean, I've seen women out there that I believe are saved, but they'll get out there and start hollering along with the men and acting like men. It's like you're supposed to be chaste, discreet. Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. How does a sister in Christ look for the Lord every day, for the coming of the Lord to come back any day? He can come back any day. Right there is one of the ways, one of the big ways, but there's a lot of other things too. Six, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So the elder men are supposed to be teaching the younger men likewise to be sober-minded. In all things, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, Sound speech. You know the best way? I, I, people say they, they, they have a problem with cussing and everything. You know the best way to have sound speech? Right here. You say, well, what are you talking about? The Bible says that in thy word, that word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. When you hide God's word in your heart, it will keep you from sin. Action. When you start living the life of Christ, it helps keep you from sin. But it also changes your speech. Why? Because the Bible says with the heart, uh, the mouth speaks. I'm trying to remember that verse exactly, but the pox Bible with the heart is where the mouth speaks. And for a lost man, the heart is, evil, heart is evil and wicked. Who can know it? That's why you have bad, you don't have sound speech. But you start studying the Word, get saved first, then start studying the Word of God and hiding God's Word in your heart, you'll notice that your speech changes. You start to have sound speech. 
They cannot be condemned. Because, like I said, can this be condemned? Oh, the lost world tries to. But can this be condemned of God? His own per perfect written word, the King James Bible. For English speaking people, no. So if you're hiding in your heart and you speak, and it starts coming out here, it can't be condemned. That he that is of a contrary part might be ashamed. When you catch brethren that start adding to and subtracting from Scripture, they should be ashamed of themselves. And when they start talking like the lost world and arguing like the lost world and acting like the lost world, they should be ashamed. Having no evil thing to say of you, exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Men in, in, at work. Okay? Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrines of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. You go to a job, you're under the authority of a, of a, of a boss, manager, whatever words they want to use. You're supposed to do your best and give it your all and do your best. Not to be a slacker. Okay? If he wants you to do something the long way, then you do it the long way. As long as it doesn't go against Scripture and it's not a safety violation, if he wants you to do it the long way, you do it the long way. But there's a shorter way. Or I think I have a better way. But, and you try to present that to your boss. He says, no, I want you doing it this way. Then you do it. And you smile. Okay? I think it's one of the hardest things. If you go to work just because your job is miserable, you might have a job that's miserable. But if you go to the work and you just look miserable and act miserable, you're not going to be a good light for the Lord. Pray before you, uh, you go to work every day. Pray during the day. Memorize some hymns. Memorize some scripture that you can go over in your head as you're doing work. And have a good attitude. It will reflect, that man's a Christian. That man's a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. No matter how tough our work gets, and I just want to just, urgh, he's just, he's smiling. And he's always giving God glory in all things. He's giving God thanks in all things. He gives God credit for everything. Oh, yeah. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, which one of the things that's happening in the body of Christ lately, they're not denying ungodliness. They're allowing ungodliness to come in. So denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Okay, the Bible talks about having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's talking about false converts. But the Bible does talk about lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Can that be a false convert? Yeah, absolutely. But can that happen to brothers and sisters in Christ? Someone comes in and whispers in the ear. We have false converts coming in, wolves in sheep's clothing coming in saying, that's okay, you can do that. Oh, it's okay, you can be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We're supposed to be denying ungodliness and we're supposed to be denying worldly lusts. But you have brethren that are trying to justify it. What happens? you got to correct them. We should live soberly. Remember, soberly. Why should we live soberly? Be sober. Be vigilant. For your adversary the devil go around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Righteously. Wouldn't we just read about the Bible? The scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness. And godly in this present world. In this present world. This is where I read this. And we're going to get into another study, but... It says, in this present world, you're doing all these things in this present world. Why? Because that's evidence, the life of Christ, not just in word, but in deed. When you're living your best every day to live every day for the Lord, what are you really doing? You're looking for that blessed hope. In this present world, Paul was looking for that blessed hope. A Christian uh, uh, 1,500 years ago was looking for the, that blessed hope. 1,000 years ago. 500 years ago, 200 years ago. You're to look for the blessed hope by the life that you live. And you have brethren that say, well, Jesus isn't coming back any day now. It might be another 5 years or 10 years. What happens? They're not living every day for Jesus Christ. And it shows. When brethren turn their back on that, made, that's an important doctrine, looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the great glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You're looking for His appearing. To happen any day. But you do it with the life that you live. All those things that we were just instructed on. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We're only two-thirds redeemed, brothers, says Christ. Our soul and our spirit's redeemed, but our, this body isn't. What are we going to do for all eternity? We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be zealous of good works. 
Verse 15 for this study. These things, these things, speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay? We are supposed to correct. We're supposed to rebuke if necessary. Okay? So the greatest cost of correction. Turn to Acts chapter 9. We're going to use Paul and Paul's relationship with Barnabas. What is the ultimate cost of correction? When you stand for the word of God and you call someone out, what's the ultimate cost? Okay, as you're turning to Acts, I'll turn it to Acts 9.26. But you got to understand, though, brothers and sisters Christ, when you go to correct someone, there's a cost. That's why it's not supposed to be take correction is not supposed to be taken lightly. You're not just supposed to be like, hey, I get to correct brethren. That means I get to be the boss, and I get to have start feeding my flesh and telling other people what to do. That's not it at all. Before you go to correct anybody, you make sure that you take a deep breath. That's my first advice. Correction is necessary, reproving, rebuking, it is necessary. In fact, it's one of the biggest things that's, that's lacking in the body of Christ today. Why? Because everybody just wants to go along to get along. We can all agree to disagree. And why are we all fighting? It's not that, because we've gotten so lazy in the body of Christ and so scared to correct anybody. What are we scared of? I don't want to get ahead of myself. But before, let's say God gives you the courage, He puts it on your heart, before you start correcting a brother in Christ, you need to stop and take a deep breath. Oh yeah, take a deep breath. Because sometimes you get frustrated with brethren. Sometimes some brethren anger you. Okay? You can get angry with brethren. You can get frustrated with brethren. But you can't come across that way when you actually come time to correct them. You need to take a deep breath. Then you need to check yourself first, because the Bible talks about hypocritical judgment. Do you have the same problem that that brother has that you're going to go correct him on? If you do, you need to get it out of your life first. You need to correct yourself first and get it out of your life. Then you can correct that brother in Christ. That's what that whole passage is talking about, the beam and the, and the moat. Okay? Once you get that sin out of your life, then you can see clearly to take the moat out of your brother's eye to get the sin out of their life. You always check yourself first. Then you check the scriptures to make sure you're right. Don't, my biggest advice, Brother Sir Christ, is don't be a PWC. Polly want a cracker. You see some man up there, oh, he's doing all the work for me. And that's, that's the Christians, I hate lazy Christians, that expect that they watch Bible studies, which is great. I watch Bible studies. God lets me do some Bible studies, praise the Lord. But you can't expect us to do all the work for you. When someone does a Bible study, you need to be looking into it for yourself to make sure that person's telling the truth. That's why I say this is the final authority. It always has been and always will be. This corrects me. This corrects you. When I go to correct you, I need to make sure I'm correcting you with the scriptures and that it's right. That correction is true. But you have brethren that will watch another brother in Christ or even a wolf in sheep's clothing, a hireling, they'll preach something that's totally wrong and they'll say, well, he said it, therefore I'm going to just parrot what he said to the brethren. Well, have you actually looked it up yourself? Oh, no, I haven't looked it up myself. I haven't done the study for myself. He said it. It sounded good. It must be true. Don't be a PWC. Do the study for yourself. All right? So we're going to go off of Paul and Barnabas for this study. The greatest cost to correction. And we're also going to find out the fruits of the agreeing to disagree as we go through here. But first I want to line up Paul and Barnabas and explain how they met and what they went through together. Some people say that they were just two men that, you know, they casually knew. They were acquaintances and they casually knew each other. And when they had their splitting apart, it, you know... It really wasn't that big of a deal. Or it was just something they could agree to disagree on. We're going to find that's not true either. It's a false teaching. It wasn't something. There's no such thing as agree to disagree. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let's look at Paul. Acts 9.26. When did Paul meet Barnabas? Acts 
26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believing not that he was a disciple. Remember, Saul, who later became Paul, he was going around killing Christians, hauling them off to prison. Okay? He was there when one of the, the, the Christians were killed. They, the people who were accusing him laid their coats at his feet, because before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So they had their witnesses that would lay their coats at Saul's feet, and they would be the ones to throw the first stone. He was there. So when you have Saul saying, hey, I'm a Christian, everybody here that are Christians are going, I know him. He's hunting down Christians. He's killing Christians. No one would believe him. But who spoke up for him? Verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had been, the, how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. So we see there that that's how they met. Barnabas saw Paul preaching for Jesus Christ. He was a witness. He vouched for Saul. Uh, Acts 12, 25, we read, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. You mean they worked together? They went out there and did things together? Yeah. And it says here, And took with them John, whose surname was Mark. That's very important for the study. After they fulfilled their ministry, after they did all the hard work, after they were out there risking their lives for the gospel, then they took John, whose surname was Mark. Turn to Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 1. Oops. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucas of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. They got chosen. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salmas, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their ministering. So John, whose surname was Mark, was there helping them. And as far as ministering to them, but he, notice it doesn't say he was preaching in the synagogues among the Jews. That's just Paul and Barnabas, not John. He ministered unto them, helped them out with their needs. Okay, I washed your clothes. Here's some food I was able to buy and procure. Here's a place for us to stay. I found a place for us to stay. That kind of stuff. And when they had gone through the island to Patmos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season, and immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to be led him, to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Patmos, they came to Pergia and 
Pamphylia. A lot of city names I'm trying to get through, so forgive me, brothers and Christ. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. This is important. Why? Because you get to the point you realize that any time it came time to actually preach the gospel, especially to the Jews, John wouldn't do it. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Right. That's important for this. Acts 13.43, we read, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Paul and Barnabas were the ones that went and continued to preach the word of God. John, whose surname was Mark, ditched them. Oh, I, I ain't going to suffer for Jesus Christ. I'm, I, I can't go through what you guys are going through. I can't handle this. I'm out of here. He had no problem hanging out with them when it was just brethren. But when it came time to go to the work, he chickened out. He lacked courage. Acts 13, 46, we read, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. They were preaching to the Jews. Now where's John, surname Mark? Not there. But more importantly, they're going through a lot together, Barnabas and, and Paul. They're going through a lot together. That's not all they went through together. Acts 13.50, but, this is what John couldn't handle, but, whose surname is Mark, not John that wrote Revelation, but John, whose surname is Mark. Acts 13.50, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief of the men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Persecution. John couldn't handle persecution. I'm going to tell you right now and get ahead of myself. Any man that wants to be in ministry, whether it's part-time ministry or full-time ministry, if they're ashamed of the gospel, they have no business being in ministry. And that's the point Paul was trying to make when we get to it. And we're seeing that here. This is what they went through. Okay. Acts 14, verse 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in a speech of Lesonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Can you imagine if Paul, you know, Barnabas, Paul, you remember when they thought we were gods? A man, but we, we had a hard time stopping them. Verse 13, When the priest of Jupiter... See, then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of them, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you would turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all things that are therein who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with good food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people, scarce they restrained the people, that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither, and after all that, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Bar you mean Barnabas was there when Paul got stoned? Yes. How do we know that? Verse 20. Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. You mean Barnabas was there when he got stoned? They got thrown out by the Jews a lot. Oh, yeah. They've been through a lot. Okay. Acts 15.1 
And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. No, notice it says no small dissension or disputation. That's, that's important. Okay, They weren't prideful and fighting much. They were just, they couldn't come to an agreement. Okay? There was a dissension among them. They had people on different two sides. What do we do? What do we do? The Jews are telling us we have to keep the law, get circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. You're saying this. What are we supposed to do? Okay. Verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. That's Paul and Barnabas doing this. Together. Acts 15.12 says, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. This isn't two people who are just acquaintances. Oh, we're just acquaintances. We're just wait. No, these are brothers in Christ that literally bled, saw each other bleed for Jesus Christ, go through such tribulation for the gospel's sake, trying to preach where they saw people get saved, added to the body of Christ. That's what they're talking about there. Okay. John, whose surname is Mark, did not want to suffer for the gospel like Barnabas and Paul did. He left them. Notice he came in after all the hard work was done, and they're just hanging out with Christians, brethren. And then when it was time to go do the hard work, he started out a little bit, and then he's like, I really don't want anything to do with this, and he takes off. Almost like he's ashamed of the gospel. Yeah. Okay, the Waldensians. The reason I make that statement, brothers Christ, I'm not being mean, but I'm just saying... Somebody that get, wants to be in ministry part-time or full-time, they should not be ashamed of the gospel. I don't give out gospel tracts. I just, I'm just too scared and too ashamed. Then you, you shouldn't be in ministry right now. Until you can get the courage to hand out gospel tracts, to tell people about Jesus Christ, you shouldn't be in ministry. Yeah, but if I preach the gospel, I could be killed. I could be stoned like Paul was. doesn't matter. You've got to get that courage to preach the gospel no matter what the cost. The Waldensians, now I can't remember the exact year, but I think it was three years, they had to go and they had to preach the gospel at Rome for three years and then they could come back and be elders in the church. Okay? It's important, brothers and sisters of Christ. How can anybody say it's not? But we're going to see that somebody's going to be a respecter of persons and they're going to say it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. No man should be preaching the word of God if they're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and won't go to the work. What's the work? Preaching the word. Being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We're the ministry of reconciliation who won't do the ministry of reconciliation. I've told you before, I've come across professing Christians that say, I, I don't feel called to really preach the gospel. I don't really be, feel called to really witness to anybody or anything. What... Bible-believing, God-fearing man would say that. Or woman, sister in Christ would say that. No one. You've been deceived. You're, you're afraid. You're, letting, you're not getting the courage. God will give you the courage. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. You want courage? Go through Jesus Christ. He'll give you courage. Has there been times where I have lacked the courage and I, was gonna, I wanted to give a gospel tract to somebody, but I didn't? Yeah, that's happened from time to time. But as a whole, I've handed out lots of gospel tracts. I've talked to people about the, the Lord. I've talked to my neighbors. I've talked to my daughter, who's turned her back on me, about the Lord. She's old enough now. I've taught her about the Lord. She doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. There are times where we might lose courage. I understand that. But I'm talking about overall, I won't do it at all. I have no courage. I will not risk my life for Jesus Christ. You have no business being in ministry. Turn to Acts 15.35. 15.35. Mm -hmm. 
Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Notice it says Paul and also Barnabas. It's just Paul and Barnabas doing the work, continuing in Antioch. Teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. It says with many others also, I'm sorry. But it's Paul and Barnabas that are being singled out. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. God put it on his heart, I want you to do this. And Paul's like, let's go do this. 37, And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But notice up there when it says that teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others, he's talking about the brethren. When it came to fellowship with the brethren, oh, John, whose surname is Mark, is all about the brethren. brethren. But when it comes to doing the hard work of the Lord and going out and preaching the gospel, he won't do it. Verse 38, But Paul thought it not good to take with him the de who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. He didn't do the work. Mm -hmm. Here's the first 39. And the contention was so sharp between them. Contention. Remember that word. Remember I said up there when Acts 15, when they were talking about how they're trying to bring in the laws of Moses. We don't know this, this, if they have to. If they, sh they have to get circumcised or not. We don't know. There's dissension and disputation. It's not the same thing as this contention here. And I'll explain why here in a second. But remember, this says the word contention. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark. Notice it so it starts with Barnabas. Okay, they didn't say, okay, we're going to agree to go our separate ways. It took one of them saying, I'm out of here. I'm done with you. It took one of them to break fellowship. And I believe it was Barnabas. Because it starts out with Barnabas. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. Verse 40, And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Now, here's the thing. What's the cost of correction? The ultimate cost of correction, brother says Christ, is you can lose a brother in Christ. You can lose brother in Christ to the world and the ways of the world. Why is this? Brethren will sit here and say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Well, first thing I want to point out is, is Proverbs 13.10. Proverbs 13.10 says, only by pride... Only by pride cometh contention. What was the word there that we read? And the contention was sharp between them? Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. The well-advised. What was Paul doing? He was well-advising. Wisdom. What was Barnabas doing? Prideful and respecters of persons. Some people say, well, real quick, it's just, they just agree to disagree. It's just something that you could, they just had some agreement where it's something that you can agree to disagree, and it got so sharp that they just went their separate ways. Not so. Pride was involved here. And like I said, I believe it was Barnabas. I agree with Paul. If you're ashamed of the gospel, you have no business being in ministry. There's a difference between God helping you. Like when I first got started, I, I kind of had a hard time like walking up and actually saying, can I give you this? It, it, took, it took me a while for God to give me some courage to start doing that. I understand that threshold of, you know, you go from being a babe in Christ to God giving you courage. The more you know this book, the more you're hiding in your heart, the more you're living it, the more courage you're going to have to hand out those gospel tracts to tell people about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But I agree with Paul. If you have... If you're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have no business going with them to confirm the churches. You have no business in ministry. Mm -hmm. But we read there in Proverbs 13.10, Only by pride cometh contention. So there had to be pride involved. Mm -hmm. And that says, And with the well-advised is wisdom. I believe, and I'm going to prove it, I believe Paul, uh, Barnabas was the only by pride cometh contention. He was causing all the contention with his pride and respecter of persons. Paul, but be well advised with wisdom, but with the well advised is wisdom. Paul was just given wisdom. He wouldn't go to the work with us. He wouldn't put his life on the line for Jesus Christ and his word. He deserted us. 
He's not coming with us. He has no business being with us. Okay? But you see them say, well, it's just something that they could agree to disagree. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.10. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.10. I was reading this in my daily reading, and God brought it to my attention that it's so important to understand. What are the fruits of we can agree to disagree? I'll tell you what the fruits are. But first, we're going to read verse 10. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Not agree to disagree. This is the opposite of agree to disagree. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. Same mind, and then you take this same mind, and you have the same judgment. So that's how you keep from, that's how you do the right thing. The same mind, the same judgment. That's what we're all supposed to be. And what's going on in the body of Christ, what's going on, is Satan has sowed these evil, wicked seeds of, you can, we can all agree to disagree. What does that lead to? Let's look at the fruits. Let's keep reading. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 1, 11. What happens when you're not of the same mind and the same judgment and you go with the philosophy of, we can all agree to disagree. And notice I said Bible Doctrines, instruction, righteousness, those four things. All scriptures given in, uh, by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. We're not, there is no agree to disagree. For reproof, there's no agree to disagree. For correction, there is no agree to disagree. For instruction, righteousness, there is no agree to disagree. We're talking about the Bible. If my favorite color is green and your favorite color is blue, because my favorite color is green, if your favorite color is blue, There is no agreeing to disagree. You're not going to tell me what my favorite color is, and I'm not going to tell you what your favorite color is. But people will take that. Well, you can agree to disagree on what the best color in the world is. No, that's not a big deal. It's just that's what I believe. But even if you want to get into a, a little bit of a talk about what is the best color in the world, it doesn't matter. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's talking about the Bible. When it comes to the Bible, there's no agreeing to disagree. You can have theories. We've talked about this. We can have theories. But what is the fruit of agree to disagree? Let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 1.11, the next verse. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. Hmm. What did we just read in Proverbs 13? Only by pride cometh contentions. When we're not all on the same page, and... Oh, it's, we can agree to disagree. What does it lead to? It leads to pride, which leads to contention. First fruit is promotes being men being prideful that leads to contentions. Do we drop the pride? No, we don't drop the pride. We just agree to disagree. And what happens when you just agree to disagree? That pride builds up and starts causing dissension, um, contentions. That pride in the brethren who follow this teaching will always be build up and turn into contentions. Proverbs 13.10, which we read, what does pride do? It destroys. Pride will destroy fellowship, will destroy the brethren coming together and being of one, of the same mind and of the same judgment. Proverbs 16.18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a high spirit before a fall. Pride, uh, Proverbs 13.10, we just read that again, only by pride cometh contention. So what is this whole fruit? How does it start? You push that we can agree to disagree. So when people get prideful in disagreements, that pride can be buried in here. We can just agree to disagree, and that pride starts building up and building up. I'm talking about the people that are wrong. Building up, building up. Sometimes a person can be right and still go about the wrong way with pride, too. I want to throw that in there, but mostly with the people that are wrong. So that's the first fruit. Pride comes in and causes contention, because we just learned that only by pride cometh contention. So if there's contentions here, it's because people are getting prideful, and they're told, it's okay, we can agree to disagree, it's okay. Why is that? Next verse. 1 Corinthians 1.12, it says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. What is the next fruit of agreeing to disagree? 
It promotes respecter of persons. Acts 10.34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Everyone starts forming their groups. It happens when you have, there's things that we can agree to disagree on. The second fruit is you got pride that leads to contentions, and then you got people starting to form groups and take sides. It happens. He says one thing, he says another, this leader over here says a third thing, and you know what? We just all need to agree to disagree. That'll never happen. People will always start taking sides. I've seen it happen every time. Oh, I'm of Brother Brian, or I'm of Brother Philip, or I'm of Brother Brad, or I'm of this person, or I'm of that person. It'll happen every time. So you have, what's the fruits of we can agree to disagree? It starts people building up pride. They get pride in the wrong thing. They start causing contentions. People start being respecter of persons, and they start taking sides. I'm of him, so I, better, I have to follow him doesn't matter if he's right or wrong. That, that doesn't play into it. Why? Because we, we, we all agreed to agree to disagree. That's what we all agreed on. And what's the final fruit of agreeing to disagree? 1 Corinthians 1.13 Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Was Christ divided? What were you just warned about in verse 10? We'll get to that, about not being divided. That there be no division. So what's the final fruit of we can agree to disagree? It divides people every time. Why? Because there's no such thing as agreeing to disagree when it comes to the Word of God. We're all supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment. So how do we avoid all this? You say, how do we avoid all these evil fruits of agreeing to disagree? Well, let's read 1 Corinthians 1.10 again. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. If you're all agreeing to disagree, then you have people speaking different things, and you're all just basically, that whole saying of agreeing to get disagree is saying, just keep your mouth shut. Keep your yap shut. We don't want to cause con uh, problems. We don't want to cause conflict. Here it says you're supposed to speak the same thing. And when people aren't speaking the same thing, you need to get together and find out what's absolute truth. And then you all need to be on the same page. And the people that refuse to get with the book, there's the door. There's a point over here. There's the door. If you don't want to get with the book, there's the door. That way, the body of Christ can be of one mind, one body. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I beseech you, brethren, beseech you, brethren, that by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you. That's how you have no division among you. You speak the same thing. And I get so frustrated because i got some brethren that I love and care about that they don't believe that. And because they don't believe that, and, they refuse, and they're starting to bring in this, well, there's things we can agree to disagree on, it's causing division. We're supposed to be the same, speak the same things. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What's going on with Paul and Barnabas? Paul's saying, hey, this man shouldn't come with us. He has no business being in ministry. Until he can overcome that fear and will be willing to risk his life for our Lord and Savior, he doesn't belong with us in ministry. When we're with the brethren, fellowshipping, yeah, yeah. But when it comes to, okay, we're going to go back to doing the work of the Lord and seeing if, you know, the fruits of that work, of that labor, he has no business. And I agree with Paul. Totally agree with Paul. But how do we, I see, with Paul and Barnabas, who was right and who was prideful? Because you're just saying, Brother Philip, that's just your opinion. That's just what you're saying. Okay, let's find out. Who was the person that tried to be like, oh, we can agree to disagree. I, I see what you're saying, Paul, but we can agree to disagree. And who stood for Jesus Christ? I am of Christ. Remember what it said there? Is Christ divided? And if you would have kept reading. Let's go ahead and keep reading. 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Now I say that every one of you that saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, verse 12. 
and I am of Christ, yet some of them that were standing for Jesus Christ. No, no, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm just going to stick with the words that I've been taught by Paul. I'm going to stick with what he told me to do. I'm of Christ. Okay, that's why I threw that in there. Who was of Christ and who was trying to just push the, we can agree to disagree. It's not that big of a deal. Acts 5.34, we read, Then stood there up and one, one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputa reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourself what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined himself, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, Refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel be the work of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest it be happily be found to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing, praise the Lord, they were counted worthy, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Once again, John, whose surname Mark, wouldn't. He wouldn't suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. Especially when Paul and Barnabas was preaching to the Jewish people. Verse 42, And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Why? It was because it was, of men, it was of God. Now we read in Acts 15, 36, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. The work of God or the work of men. Okay, This was actually what God put on their heart and said, This is what I want you to do. Acts 5.38 says, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel of this work be of men, it will come to naught. Acts 15.39, So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. He wanted Mark, who sur uh, John, whose surname was Mark, to come along. Was that of God or was that of men? Did Barnabas complete the task that we just read up there? Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. No. It was the work of men. Barnabas was in the wrong. It wasn't something that they could agree to disagree. Barnabas got so prideful in respect to our persons that he refused the correction that Paul was giving him and forsook his brother in Christ. What's the ultimate cost? So let me get this done, because I'm not done yet. Acts 5.39 But if this be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest, lest happily be found even to fight against God. Then you turn to Acts 15.40 that we just read. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. The brethren said, okay, I agree with Paul. So you see here, you even have Barnabas that wouldn't even listen to the brethren that were there. Being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. He just went his own way and took John, his surname Mark, just took off. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Paul was in the right. There's no getting around this. But you still have brethren that will get around it. And they'll strive and strive and strive and try to get around that and say, Oh no, it was just something that they could agree to disagree on. And the contention got so much that there was pride involved. But I believe by those evidence that we just talked about comparing Scripture with Scripture, Barnabas was 100% in the wrong. Paul was 100% in the right. But what's the cost of correcting a brother in Christ? There's a chance that you might lose that brother in Christ. You might lose that fellowship. Okay, you might lose that fellowship. What about Paul? It's going to go for a little bit. What about Paul 
and Peter. Don't do you guys remember the story about how Paul had to stand up to Peter? Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Thank you, Lord. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. I'm going to read on here because I have notes where I've highlighted some things that I want to talk about. But Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. This is those situations where sometimes you can talk to him privately and say, hey, this isn't right, and try to correct the brethren privately. But there's some situations where you've got to rebuke them openly because you see something happening, that what that brother's doing is wrong, is starting to fester like a disease and starting to spread to the other brothers and sisters in Christ. So you've got to hit the source, you've got to hit the heart, and you've got to rebuke that brother. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came to James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And we'll explain why this, is, why this was happening. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him. They disassembled likewise with him. But get this part right here, brothers of Christ. In so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. You mean Barnabas was a respecter of persons? Barnabas had the Holy Spirit in it. He knew that was wrong. Paul, uh, P, uh, Peter knew it was wrong, but notice he said it did, he did it out of fear, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He didn't say this is the right thing to do. He didn't say that there's nothing wrong with this. It was saying he was doing it out of fear. But it said in so much as Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas was starting to become a respecter of persons. This is before they broke up. I know it's Galatians, but it's going back talking about before they broke up. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live after as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, and we might that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if what... Remember, we talked about this. We even read one part, but we talked about another study. The Jews kept coming in saying, for us to... We believe, just like you do, but for us to be together, the Gentiles must be, uh, must be circumcised and they must keep the law of Moses. Uh, no. And they started adding that in salvation, and you have to do that to be saved. Verse 17, But if while we seek to be justified of Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. But if I build again the things which I destroyed, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither man nor woman. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. But if I destroy, if I build again the things which I destroyed, oh no, no, there's Jews. Only Jews can get saved. Salvation is of the Jews. That's how it was in the Gospels, in the Old Testament. I make myself a transgressor, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for in righteousness come the law by the law. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. What's going on here? Now you don't have to turn here, but Acts 15, 24 says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Acts 10, 28, we read about Peter. He said, And he said unto them, You know how that it is that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. 
But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Paul was treating the Gentiles that got saved as, uh, as common and unclean again. Even after everything that God showed them. And people started to praise the Lord. The whole point of that was, is, then have God granted repentance to salvation to the, to the Gentiles also, to the Greeks. For Acts 10.34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Okay, brethren, we're becoming followers of Peter's actions. Peter's doing it, so I guess I should too. I mean, look at him. He's a great man of God. He actually knew Jesus Christ. That's what's going on here. Peter starts falling back into fear and wanting to please the Jews. So he stepped back from the Gentiles. And Paul saw that. And it wasn't just that Peter was doing it. If it was Peter doing it by himself and nobody else was doing it, I'm pretty sure Paul would have walked up and, and talked to him one-on-one. -on -one. Brother, what you're doing is not right. And you know it's not right. But he was doing it and it started catching in the body of Christ like fire. Like wildfire along the Jews that were saved, that like wildfire, in so much that as Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. So what do you do with that situation? You confront the person head on, in front of everybody. That's where it says rebuke. Therefore rebuke. Therefore rebuke those that sin. Rebuke before all. I want to say it right. Them that sin. Sorry, brother. Sorry. Them that sin. Rebuke before all that others may fear. He rebuked him to his face, and all the others that were there were like, "Yeah, we probably shouldn't have done this." And they all started repenting. But it started with with Peter being corrected and rebuked publicly. First Timothy five twenty says, "Them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear." It was right here. <laughs> I did it again in my notes. Sorry. Uh, Galatians 3.26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. There, for they are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul had to correct Peter to his face. Now, Paul and uh, Peter didn't have that same relationship that Barnabas had. I believe Paul and Barnabas was closer than, than Paul and Peter were. But, brothers and sisters of Christ, time and time again, when you go to correct a brother in Christ, remember to take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Check yourself first. Check the scriptures to see if those things are so. And then correct that brother in Christ. Okay? We need that correction in the body of Christ. We need more brethren that know the Word of God, that's hiding it in their heart and living it. We need to be holding each other accountable. And you need, I repeat, you need to get away from that false teaching that's just, like, like I said, it's like a plague on the body of Christ. Oh, we can agree to disagree. We can agree to disagree. Look what it's doing to the body of Christ. It's causing such division, pride, contention. People are being respecters of persons. I'm of this person. I'm of that person. 2 Timothy 4.8. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.8. I'm in 1 Timothy. How many made that mistake? I thought it was in 2 Timothy, but I'm in 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4.8 Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible says that as we get closer and closer to the catching away of the body of Christ, there's going to be a falling away in the body of Christ. And my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters of Christ, is to be one of the ones that are still standing for the Lord and His Word. That you haven't started falling into lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That you haven't followed, started getting spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. And what happens? You're not after Christ. You've taken your eyes off the Lord. To all them that love is appearing, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Verse 10. 
For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. This is Paul. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You think he didn't try to correct Demas and say, Hey, what you're doing there is wrong. You're starting to fall back into the world. What you're doing there is wrong. Paul has a lot of love. I mean, he talks about how he prayed. He cried night and day with tears, warning the brethren of false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, warning brethren to stand, stand, stand. Don't faint. Don't falter. Strive together. We have one mind, one of the same mind, of the same judgment. You think he didn't try to help Demas? Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And has departed unto Thessalonica. Cretans to Galatia. Now notice it didn't say Cretans has fallen away. But what this is talking about is we're getting spread thin. We used to have a lot of brethren. Everybody was all happy about going around and doing the work of the Lord. Now there's fewer of us. Look, people are falling away. The falling away started so short. It started like right when Paul was preaching. At the very beginning, you could start seeing the falling away. Here it is right here. But the falling away being great is going to happen right before the catching away of the body of Christ. And I believe we're there. Titus unto Damasia. There's Titus. He's not law. He didn't forsake Paul, he just, you had to go here. We need a man here preaching the word and holding them accountable and then holding him accountable. And we need a man to go over here. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. We'll get back to this Mark. And bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. I had to send Tychus over to Ephesus. We're spread thin, but I need you. There's another thing about Paul where it's like, he's not a one-man show. You're not supposed to be a one-man show. But Mark here, someone said, what if it's that same Mark? Remember, it, it specifically said it's John whose surname is Mark first before it just said Mark, so you know what kind of Mark it is. There's more than one Mark. There's more than one John, <laughs> okay? There's more than one Simon in the Bible. So we got to be careful. But let's say for, you know, because I don't want to get into a debate or an argument, let's say this is the same Mark. Can God pick someone up and Mark, could God have broken Mark at some point? John, whose surname is Mark, had broken him at some point and he just got on fire for the Lord and said, you know what, I'm not going to be ashamed anymore. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. And he got out there and started going hardcore preaching the word of God. And now Paul went from, I can't use you, you have no business being with us, that God picked that, per that brother Christ up that failed the Lord. And now he's saying, bring him with thee, for he is profitably in the ministry. Could this be the same Mark? Honestly, I, I honestly want to first start to say no, because it just says Mark. It doesn't say John, whose surname is Mark. But my point is, is God can pick anybody up, no matter what mistakes you've made. God can pick you back up, if you let him. But you have to drop the pride, so there's no contention, so there's no respecter of persons. Well, I'm of this person, I'm of that person. So there's no division. You gotta drop that pride. The number one thing that will destroy a man in ministry, the number one thing, and I see it happening in some of the brethren in ministry, the number one thing that will destroy you in ministry is what? Pride. Pride. It will destroy you every time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, remember, the reason we take correction seriously is because we understand. Some of us brethren, are, you have the Nicolaitans, the Bible talks about the Nicolaitans. They like the Lord over the flock. They like to tell everybody what to do and what not to do. You've got those kind of people. But I'm talking about people like me and people like some of the brethren that are watching. Okay? We understand that correcting a brother in Christ is a serious thing. There's a cost to it. What's the cost? We could lose our brother in Christ. If they've gotten so prideful that when you try to correct them, they cause contentions... And through those contentions, they try to force people to be a respecter of persons. And through being a respecter of persons, you cause division. Brothers and sisters of Christ, check, we need to check ourselves. And realize that, yes, we are to correct, but correcting is a serious thing. And we need to take it seriously. And you need to understand, I'm not, I did this study because I don't want you lied to. 
I want you to understand the cost. The seven years that I've been saved, when I was newly saved, I received a lot of correction more than I corrected anybody else. There was times where I jumped the gun because I wanted to fight, 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 and I hurt. I started being a PWC. You know, one of the biggest things that someone had, to, a brother had to correct me on was, is you just say you say, you say Brian says a lot. Well, Brian says this, or Brian says that. Brian says this, brother Brian at King James Video Ministries. Um, not that he was wrong, but he kind of I got had to get corrected and say, well. How come you don't do the study yourself and you start memorizing the scripture and get hiding in here so then you can start saying, Thus saith the Lord. My brother Brian was right. Thus saith the Lord. But you're saying the scriptures say it. The Lord's saying it. We have to get past that. And I, like I said, but when I was newly saved, I got a lot of correction from the brothers in Christ. Praise the Lord. I thank every brother and sister in Christ out there that pointed me to this. That's the solution to all my problems. I thank you, brothers and sisters of Christ. As I got older, I received less correction. I started giving out more correction. That's how it should be. You should, as you get grow more, I'm talking about older in the faith. As you grow more in the faith and God does a lot more sanctification, you're still not above correction, but you'll find that you get corrected less and you'll have to do more correcting as a brother or sister in Christ. Now, before we end this, because I don't want to get, because I said sister in Christ, Sisters in Christ, you can, you can correct a brother in Christ, but you need to take another brother with you and be a witness. I witnessed him doing this. It's wrong according to the scriptures. I'm here to help you, brother. And I brought brother so-and-so to show you what the scriptures have to say about what you're doing. You can be a witness. Be careful that you don't start acting like men where I can just correct anybody and anyone. You can be a witness. Okay, be careful. You can correct a sister in Christ. The elder sh women should be teaching those things that we talked about. And they should be correcting the younger sisters in Christ and, and, and helping them get on that path and not stray from the path. All right. So hopefully this has helped you to encourage you to understand because a lot of brethren were saying, I wish, I pray, and that's a prayer for me too, brother, that, that put that prayer request out under the prayer video. Um, that there wouldn't be so much fighting among the body of Christ. But I'm telling you, the number one reason there's a lot of fighting among the body of Christ is because they've been taught that there are things that we can agree to disagree on, and that's a satanic, sinful, wicked teaching. If you go back far enough, whether this brother, I believe this brother saved that taught it, and he learned it from this brother that was saved that taught it, if you go back far enough, some wolf in sheep's clothing, some hireling, some satanist, snuck into the body of Christ and started planting those seeds and pushing that teaching. And it's false. That's the number one reason why we have such fighting in the body, among the body of Christ. The pride leads to contention, leads to respecter of persons. I'm of so-and-so, I'm of this person, I'm of that person. And it leads to division. If we stand firm to the Word of God and we start correcting one another using the Word of God, do it with love, not out of anger, not out of bitterness, but with love and with the, with the heartfelt desire that I'm trying to help you get back on the right path. So we can be of the same mind and of the same judgment. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that you've, you've kept up with me this far and understand that there's a cost to correction. And that cost, the ultimate cost to correcting a brother in Christ, you can lose a brother in Christ. Paul and Barnabas were close brothers. They'd been through so much. Paul was stoned to death with Barnabas there. They'd probably been they'd been thrown out of cities. They've probably been beaten together for the for the testimony of Jesus Christ, for the gospel. They've been through a lot together. And what will destroy a fellowship a great fellowship between two brothers? Pride. Pride. But there's a cost to correction. And we should not fear that cost. But I just wanted you to know there is a cost to correcting a brother in Christ. Every time you do it, you risk losing fellowship with that brother in Christ. And I think that fear is the reason why most brethren want to keep, keep quiet. They don't want to say anything. And I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to rock the boat. Because they, don't, they fear losing that fellowship. But you've got to risk it, brother and sister Christ, if you're lined up with here. And this is right. And they're wrong. You've got to stand for what is right, especially in these last days. Maybe we can slow down the falling away. 
But the only way we're going to do that is if we are of the same mind and of the same judgment. And the only way we're going to be that way is if the brethren stand up and start correcting brothers and sisters in Christ and saying, this is right, this person's wrong. This is right, that person's wrong. I'm all up for correction. I've left my email out there. I've left the P.O. box to write letters. You can write emails. I've even talked to brethren who disagree with me on Skype. Um, I'm here. for. I, I'm not above correction. Okay? And I actually mean it. I'm not going to just say it, and then when someone comes to me, I'm not going to look at them and go, you know my stands, get away from me. I'm not going to be like that. When I say I'm open for correction and you want to talk about anything that has to do with the Bible that you think I'm wrong on, I'm here. I'm pointing at my computer where the camera is, the headset is, to talk to the brother in Christ, and we'll get our Bibles out, sword searcher, and we'll start finding out. The Bible's always right, but we'll find out if I line up with the Bible or if you line up with the Bible. But correction is so important, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's so important. And remember, you're the first one that gets to correct yourself. You always had the first chance. God, when Peter was doing what he was doing, God, I know God gave him a chance to correct himself, but he gave in to his fear. God will always give you a chance to correct yourself first. That's why the Bible talks about your conscience bears witness with your, the Holy Ghost. God will have you come across scriptures that will condemn what you're doing, and you'll get a chance, he'll give you a chance to correct yourself first. Then, because of love, God will correct you through brethren, he'll send a brother your way. Then through love, God will chasing you to get you back on the right path. I'm, I'm grateful that we have a God that loves us so much. Look at all these chances he's given us. Instead of just wiping us out there on the spot. That's a lot of love. He's got more patience than, than, than we have. God has more patience and more love for us than all of our patience and love combined. So I want to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.